uh, after about 10 months, winds up on Lizzie's midwife, Lizzie's doorstep, to have his baby. And Lizzie doesn't know. She delivers his baby, and it's a black baby. So she's in a whole lot of trouble. Um, and that, <coughs> that character was just a small character in my first book. But I thought, wow, she's really interesting. She's so contradictory. On the one hand, she's behaving really uh, like your worst, your worst nightmare as a sister-in-law. And on the other hand, she had the gumption to go do something that pretty much gets her ostracized from her entire country. Um, and that's why it's called our own country, because they need to find their own country. Uh, ironically, the revolution, which was fighting for freedom, couldn't fight for their freedom at that time. So that's just the background. I'm going to read you um, a little bit, and then um, and then I'll show you my PowerPoint. So the scene I'm going to start with, um, basically, sh her best friend is her family's slave, Cassie. And Cassie's from Barbados, so I'm going to do a very, very poor Barbadian accent. I'm going to play you a good one, good Barbadian accent on the tape soon. But she and Cassie are arguing. She wants, she's fallen in love with this shipwright named John Watkins. He's actually half black. His dad was the then, I didn't mention him because I was scared of getting a lawsuit, but Benny Wentworth, his, his dad was Benny Wentworth, and his mom was one of the Wentworth slaves. Now that's fiction. I don't believe Benny Wentworth father children um, of that kind, but uh, I didn't want anyone getting ancestor to come hunting me down. So I just said former governor. Anyway, she's going to deliver a sack that he left in the kitchen. He's working out on Langdon's yard as a shipwright, and she just feels that she wants to deliver the sack with his lunch in it that he forgot at home. But of course, such, she doesn't really want to deliver his sack. She wants to see him. And Cassie knows what's up. Cassie is the only person she really has any bond with at this point in the story. She's suffered a lot of deaths in the family, and she hates her parents. So, okay, here we go. <coughs> um, okay. After breakfast, everyone repaired to his chamber. I went into the kitchen. Upon entering, I noticed an old tattered gunny sack on the table. Cassie was outside breaking up the hard soil in the garden for some potatoes. I opened the back door and felt the chill morning air assault me, but the sun was strong and the air smelled of spring. Cassie, is that walking sack upon the table? She nodded. And it my fault, too. It was just turning to leave, and I opened my fat mouth about something. I made him forget. Never mind whose fault it is, I said. The point is, what is he to eat all day? Will you have the man starve? Cassie set her shovel against the side of the house. She wiped her hands on her apron. Then, slowly lifting her head, she let her eyes rest upon my face. No, you don't, Miss Eliza. No, I don't what? Cassie approached me until we stood only inches apart. No, you don't go putting yourself somewhere you don't belong. The devil, he follow you and take our Watkins back to hell with him. What on earth do you mean, Cassie? I simply wish to take the poor man his victuals. The day is fine, and I'm not otherwise engaged. So you go be otherwise engaged, Miss Eliza. I send Linda to him. She happy to go. What business is he to you? I did not reply, but returned, feelings hurt, to the kitchen. She followed me there like an angry wasp. You want to see him hang like I am in the smokehouse? You think your uncle or even your father won't do it? I wish to bring him his sack as a Christian kindness, I said her turning to indignation. Why needed I to argue my case with our slave? It will do me good to stretch my legs. I've been indoors for too long and restless. Restless, yes, I sure agree with that, Cassie nodded. You plenty restless. Cassie, I said warmly, I know of no other slave who would dare speak to her mistress so. Suddenly, Pe Cassie picked up the gunny sack, thrust it at me, and said, well, go, go, but have a care what I say. Cassie know white folk and their ways. Delighted to be in possession of the sack at last, I kissed her on her angry cheek, found my cape, and departed. I strode down Deer Street toward the ferry, shielding my eyes against the bright sun, 
my heart filled with effervescent hope. Now I'm going to read the next little scene where she actually sees Watkins. Um, Watkins had been too focused on his work to notice my presence. Now, however, he stood up and then slowly descended a steep wooden ladder to the ground. Though it was cold in the island wind, this is over on Badger's Island. I don't, what do they call it now? Badger's Island? Okay. okay. Watkins' white shirt was translucent with perspiration. The muscles of his arms were outlined in sawdust and grime. His hair, dark beneath and golden above, was wound in tight curling locks that fell across his forehead. He wiped his face with the edge of a rolled sleeve. Miss Boylston, he said, bowing. The sound of my name upon his lips sent an unwanted thrill through me. Watkins, I nodded. One did not curtsy before a slave, but I had nearly done so. I then proffered his sack. It seems you forgot this. Cassie blast her, he looked annoyed. She distracted me, she always does, for hardly has one epic tale ended than another begins. I would have liked to agree with him, for his words describe my dear Cassie perfectly. Instead, I found myself saying, is it her fault then that you forgot your sack? Entirely. He sounded quite grave, but then he smiled briefly, revealing a pair of dimples so fine they stunned me into silence. I handed him his sack. As Watkins took it, I happened to notice his hands. There were angry red sores upon his palms. Your hands, I exclaimed, allow me to see them. Instinctively, he took a step back and put his hands behind him. There's nothing wrong with them. <clears throat> but there is, I insist. I quickly grasped his wrists in a proprietary manner. He flinched as I turned his palms up. Two, nay, three sores bled freely on each palm. The blister on his right hand was quite inflamed. I'd heard that such wounds could become putrid and require the amputation of a limb, or worse. Watkins, how can you, how can you be such a fool? <clears throat> Your uncle likes it not when I do not earn my keep, he replied. That's an odd notion, I released my grasp. My uncle makes a tidy profit off of your labor. The least he can do is keep you alive to work another day. Then, without listening to his rejoinder, I went off to complain to Colonel Langdon. Miss Boylston, Watson, Watkins called entreatingly. If you insist on telling anyone, let it be Mr. Hackett. I have no wish to importune the Colonel, I beg you. I nodded my assent without turning round. Several rods off, a man I guessed to be Hackett stood over a soft pit. A short, florid-faced man, Hackett was growing redder at what he saw in the pit. No, no, man, he cried to the bottom sawyer, one of the men who had accompanied me on the ferry. Can you not see that you are far off the mark? I half expected him to leap down there and blurted, Mr. Hackett, a moment of your time, if you please. At the sound of my voice, Hackett turned. As I was bringing my family slave his victuals, I have discovered him to be in a most egregious condition. How easily I adopted the superior tone Mama might have used. It was quite effective. Hackett was officious as he led me away from the pit. I know your uncle, a fine man, he said placatingly. Indeed. Together we approached Watkins, who stood at the base of the staging. He shifted from foot to foot, impatient and annoyed. Then he removed an apple from his sack, took a bite, and was about to take another when he saw us approach. Your hands, barked Hackett. After some hesitation, Watkins finally opened his hands for Ms. Mr. Hackett's inspection. Seeing the open sores, Hackett made a face, spat on the ground, and growled, By God, Watkins, three days off. Now get out of here and take care of those sores. I'll send word to your master. Hackett had turned to go back to the saw pit when I interjected. I should think his duties must be more varied if the same thing is not to happen again. Instead of replying, the shipmaster now merely grumbled something and went his way. Well, Watkins, I said with a cheerful lift in my voice, you may as well finish your lunch while we wait for the ferry. Suddenly, and with vicious force, Watkins threw his apple core toward the shore. He mounted the ladder, put his tools in a sack, carried them down with him, and took them to a nearby shed for safekeeping. Then he joined me with obvious reluctance. The shore was windy. And as the ferryman had not yet arrived, Watkins sat himself beside a beach plum and opened his gunny sack. 
Finding a biscuit, he bit into it noisily. The silence became uncomfortable. I said, Cassie shall have some kind of salve, no doubt. She'll make you well in a few days, undoubtedly. His sudden coldness, so different from the smile I had received when he had first greeted me, wounded me. I almost felt like weeping, but instead I asked, have I, have I given offense, Watkins? Watkins turned, smiled at me oddly, and said, my mother, a most excellent woman, died when I was nine. I'm very sorry for it, but what mean you by that? The ferryman approached, Watkins waved to him, and hastened to finish his biscuit. He then rose, dusting the sand off his bridges. Only that it has been a long time since I've had a mother, and I have no great wish for one now. <laughs> the rebuke, so unexpected, made me turn away. That is a cruel thing to say. Tears pooled in the ledges of my eyes. No, not cruel, <clears throat> he hastened to reply, just as the ferryman approached. It's just I. Come in aboard, the ferryman was upon us. A moment, Watkins turned his shoulders to the ferryman and looked at me, but I could not read his eyes. I understood with dawning horror that I neither knew him nor knew how to speak to him, and that my attempt to do so had been a grievous error. We returned to the other shore in silence. There, I cursed myself roundly for having had the clever idea to bring Watkins his gunny sack. So um, I'm going to read just a little bit more. Uh, so next time she sees him, I can find it. And the next time she sees him is uh, out on the plains. Um, I don't know if you know about the annual celebrations and uh, the government with the elected officials. Do you know you know about that? Um, where every year uh, all the Portsmouth black folks went out onto the plains and it was a huge celebration and they elected officials, which you could also, if we talk about it, if you ask me questions, I'll tell you more about it. It's, it's kind of um, complicated. It was not until June that I next came upon Watkins. This was out on the plains west of town at the annual Negro elections. Cassie and the Whipple slaves had been speaking of nothing else for near a month. This, I might just add that here, Eliza gets just a tiny taste of what it feels like to be the outsider. Just a tiny taste. She's not happy about it. Um, Miss Eliza, there'll be music and dancing, and everyone has such a good time. Everyone will look beautiful, gushed Dinah, one morning. Oh, please come, Miss Eliza. She pressed her slender fingertips together. But won't I stand out? Maybe a little, Dinah admitted. But other white folk come to watch. Oh, do come. Here she gently grasped the sleeve of my gown and I ascended. It was a fine warm day when I first espied a scene that made me doubt my own vision. A huge crowd of Negroes had gathered on Middle Street. Right here, right? There must have been men and women, not just from Portsmouth, but from all the neighboring towns. King Nero Brewster, their elected leader, and several of his officers, all dressed in brightly colored tunics, led a procession that included Negroes on horseback with guns and swords. I followed the crowd down the street into, onto Middle Road and into the plains on the outskirts of town. Many sang to drums and lively music. All the while, I tried but failed to understand what these elections were about and why families such as my own allowed them. When we arrived at the plains, I saw that there were already near 200 Negroes waiting there, all dressed in their best and most festive clothing. Standing behind the crowd, I watched the solemn ceremony in which the new officers were elected and sworn in. King Nero stood on a hastily erected podium and called out each name in turn. After each name, murmurs went up among the crowd. To my surprise, John Watkins' name was called, and he emerged from the crowd to claim his title as a newly elected deputy. It is a very great honor for one so young, said someone beside me. King Nero Brewster spoke a few words in praise of Watkins, and the audience clapped and cheered. Watkins descended the makeshift podium, and though I stood at some distance, his eyes lit on me. He seemed deeply surprised at my presence, and I actually imagined he might speak to me, 
When all at once he veered to his left and smiled at Linda, she wore a bright red turban and a simple red gown which made her lovely dark skin glow. A turquoise stone sat at the hollow of her neck. Linda, shy and silent with my family, laughed easily with Watkins and their mutual friends who had gathered around him. I soon left for home, imagining how they would dance to early light at Bell's Tavern to Cuffy's lively violin. It was right and good for Watkins to love Linda, but as I walked home from the plains, I grew unaccountably morose, and I found myself wishing that a gentle wind would blow Linda out to sea. The following morning, having made my way to the kitchen after breakfast, I asked Cassie, how did you enjoy the party? Cassie put a worn brown hand to her head. It was creased with wrinkles, though I doubted she had seen her 35th birthday. I drank too much and now I have a headache. Poor Cassie, have you no remedy you can take? Oh yes, I take it already. It doesn't work. Here she gave me a sheepish grin. And, and the others, they had a good time? Oh, they all have a fine time. Linda, she danced with Johnny till Cuffy can't hold the bow no longer. They keep begging him for one more, one more. I'm glad you enjoyed yourself, Cassie, truly. I kissed her on the cheek and let her get on with her work. I then quietly repaired to my chamber, where I allowed myself an hour of exquisite misery replete with copious tears. Thank you, that's the end of the reading part. <laughs> um. So now I'm just going to show you my PowerPoint. Um, this, let's see. this is Henry Sherburn's house, and this is actually at 62 Deer Street. And the pretty more remarkable thing is when I came to Portsmouth to try to find a house where all of this would take place, I drove up Deer, I drove up, I forget what street, and then you turn right on Deer Street, and I looked to my right where I felt like a house should be for this Uncle Chase where she escapes and she goes and lives with him. And there was this house. There was this house. I, it was like this had been preordained. It was very freaky, actually. Um, <clears throat> so this is where the action takes place. You can drive by it. Um, this is the Moffat Lad house, many of you know, and this uh, we have people in my book running back and forth because they could just run through the field. So <clears throat> Cassie became friends with all the Whipple slaves, and the Whipple slaves just came and went from the back door of the kitchen of the, of the Deer Street house. Um, and Eliza basically hangs out with them because she can barely tolerate her parents. So she's mainly in the kitchen or running back right here. Um, now, this is uh, the part of my program where I talk about what was running through my head as I was boldly going forth on this adventure. Um, the first one I had in my head was this one. Don't write in the vernacular. Um, I've been, I've heard that from various people, various white writers actually. Don't write in the vernacular. Um, and I really tried not to. And when, when, Cassie, when Cassie emerged, she sounded like she was from Barbados. There's nothing I could do about it, except what I decided was to go to Barbados. And that I did, and I listened to the language. So I, I tried to get it as right as I could. And then I made a promise to myself that I would make all the characters sound as authentic as I could. So Eliza doesn't sound anything like her uncle, and they don't sound anything like the shipwrights um, or the workmen in town. So I really, you know, I was fair in, in how I presented it. But I do terrible, but it's the woman, um, Christina Panfilio, I'm going to play you a little segment of how she sounds, and she's, she's great at it. Uh, let's see. So these are some of the reasons why uh, it's it's basically, I was warned not to write in the vernacular, is that the vernacular has been used, especially in popular media, um, in embarrassing and um, painful ways. Uh, not because necessarily the vernacular is incorrect, but because of the huge disparity 
that you see when Hollywood is treating black characters, or in any case used to treat black characters, they just never sounded educated. They never sounded, you know, they always sounded one way, let's put it that way. So this is a famous line, and do you have your number, Mr. Jeffrey? And it's from, anyone know the, the still where that's from? Rear window. Rear window. Yeah, when um, the photojournalist calls the detective and says, listen, I think there's been a murder, and, and you've got to come down here. And the poor little housemaid says, do you have your number, Mr. Jeffrey? And Gail Pem Pemberton wrote a whole essay on how painful she found. Like, come on, Mr. Hitchcock, what do you, you know, this was modern times. This was in the 50s. He really didn't have a good excuse. So um, let me just scroll down. This is more than that. Wanted. Oh, this is another really terrible one. Lord Z, we got to have a doctor. I don't know nothing about birth and babies. And um, you, you definitely know what that's from, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, my Cassie. OK. This is a little bit what Cassie might have looked like. Not, this is older than my Cassie's really young. Let me see if I can do this techno thing where I escape out of here and play you a little bit of it. Escape. Okay, so I just want you to know Cassie has a real accent and she's utter means other and stays are, you know, the garment that uh, you tighten like that. So hopefully this will play and you can hear just how Christina does a Bajan accent. I must have other stays. Cassie complained to me about a week after we had returned. Well, what do you want me to do about it? I asked. All Cambridge came to a halt, yet the life inside me took no note of it. Cassie had already let out my three remaining gowns. Were I to abandon the old stays, none of them would fit. But that was not what we truly argued about. She had wanted me to tell Mama the truth in the carriage on the way home from Portsmouth where I would be protected by the presence of others. She was distressed that I had waited so long. Now you home, Cassie remarked. Nobody see if she kill you. Oh, she will not kill me, I said. Hurry up and tie my stays. Okay, so that just gives you a little flavor of what it sounds when an when actor who knows what she's doing can do it. So that was my choice to use the vernacular, and I, I don't regret that decision, but it is somewhat controversial, um, I suppose. So the next don't is, don't make the love interest too handsome. Uh, I don't know, something apparently is wrong with a really handsome black man, and it, but I know, I don't know. They just said don't make him too handsome. Fine, so. Not like that. <laughs> or like that. And especially not like that. <laughs> OK, fine. So, um, and of course, you, you're aware of the reason for this. And I think uh, Aldous Huxley did it best when he has a satire of what a white uh, European idea of, of pornography would be, and this is when he wrote in Brave New World when they went to the feelies. And in the, in the feelies, if you've read, you remember Brave New World? Uh, they go to the feelies, this white couple. There stood the stereoscopic images locked in one another's arms of a gigantic Negro and a golden-haired young bracky cephalic beta plus female. <laughs> The scent organ, meanwhile, breathes pure musk, expiringly a soundtrack, super dove cooed, ooh, ooh, and vibrating only 32 times a second. A deeper than African bass made answer, ah, ah, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. So <laughs> it's a horrible satire, but that's why you're not supposed to make uh, the stereotype of the, of the gorgeous black man. So what was I going to do? I mean, the problem is. If you're a hetero woman, you like handsome guys, right? So I had to give him some, he couldn't be perfect. He couldn't be a, a perfect figure. So, and also he's half. Um, I decided to make him half black because here again was my, my quest for authenticity. I didn't think a white woman of that time would be as drawn, as easy, 
absolutely drawn, suckered in to falling in love with a very dark-skinned man because he would have been something very foreign to her, just an, another being. But with the half, with the way he looks, in fact, she's in denial when she first meets him. She just thinks he's a tan white guy. So she allows herself to come in there in a way I didn't think she really would um, with a dark skin. So this, I mean, he's pretty cute, right? This is sort of what I looked at uh, to guide me. Um, John Watkins has blue eyes. He's definitely very handsome, but he's not very tall. And that's, his, that's the best I could do as far as not making him too cute. He's smart but self-educated. Obviously, he wouldn't have had an education. He, he's self-taught. And he also has some flaws. He can be very defensive and very angry. He, he sort of thinks he's white and doesn't really understand why he's a slave. So he's got, other, he's got a lot of issues. Um, and then I think I've got one last don't. <laughs> so this was going on in my head a lot. White girl, you can't know what it's like. And then, that's, I mean, that was not my family at all, but you get the idea to live like this. So, um, how did I do it? You know, how did I, this isn't the last slide. Well, I, I mean, you can ask me in the Q&A when we get there, but part of why I write is so that I can get inside there. Um, what I lack in experience, I really try to make up with in empathy, and I want to know. And so for me, writing is the striving to know what it's like, um, in, even if I haven't had experience. And I think that's a writer's job, to, to put yourself into minds of people that may not resemble you at all. So just one last slide, I believe, and then, um, oh yeah. This is, so, of course, I've read all of these wonderful people. In fact, I've just taught, finished teaching Harriet Jacobs to some high school kids. Uh, you think you can write these stories? You know, what nerve you've got. And um, what I then tell myself so I can keep going and writing every day is, well, they didn't do a bad job, but, you know, I, I can only tell my story. I can only tell my story. And um, I honestly feel like brains don't have color. Brains don't have sex. And if you lack experience, then go seek it out. Go learn. And um, I try to be authentic in my writing, and uh, I try to be fearless. Thank you. somewhere when they had to when the Tories had to get out of Cambridge they needed to run somewhere and I thought well where would be a prosperous merchant where they could kind of you know regroup so um, I thought Nashua and then I forgot how but um, I got a hold of this and suddenly the Whipple slave started calling to me uh, this has pretty much the most exhaustive treatment of of the actual slaves of that time period. And I, I just sucked the marrow out of this book and I realized, okay, I have to set it here. So that's why. That's why. Other questions? Yeah. You said you'd explain a little bit further about the elections at the Portsmouth Plains. Can you do that? Well, what I, what I know, there may be people here who know more, but uh, every year the, um, the black folks in the area, I don't think it was just the slaves. It was free and enslaved, got together and elected officials. So they elected um, deputies, they elected, um, what do you call him? That the president, I forget his name. Chief. Uh, King Chief. Chief. Uh, maybe that. Yes, Chief. And so these folks 
folks um, ended up having some power in their own community to determine, for example, punishments of people committed infractions, and they would they would meet out punishments, um, and it was a way of being together. Really, I think more than anything, of being together and feeling like they're they had their own society. And you mentioned a king somebody. Did that position not change, or was that an elected king? King Nero well? was actually the name of um, King Nero Brewster. I think it was. That was one of the <coughs> chiefs of that time period. But I made my guy Watkins uh, into a deputy, which he didn't exist, so he wasn't really a deputy. Any other questions? Yeah. Lecture stated that uh, you had a black and white connection in, in your personal life, and why? So why do you write your inter interracial relationships? I set her up there in the front chair. So I really do want to talk about that just to give you a little context. Um, one of the things I've thought about for for a long, long time is the fact that um, yes, of course, segregation is a bad thing, but actually, I realized personally it was a bad thing for me too. Um, and I was one of uh, the first white group of kids to be in a, an experiment where they threw two districts of schools together, one low-income black kids and the other middle-class white kids, and they just decided one year in the 60s they were going to put us all in the same school and see what happened, the great experiment. It was really a disaster. And I literally fled in something called white flight. I literally fled in the back of someone's car because some girls decided they were going to kill me after school. And um, I left. It was very painful for me. And it really wasn't until I was an adult that I realized, after having been on the step squad in my high school and learning Lindy Hop and playing early jazz, I realized that I was seeking all my life to to get back that connection that I had to give up on because I sensed that I sensed that those black girls were actually having a little more fun than I was <laughs> at the time. And I missed them. I missed being able to, to associate with them. So uh, I've been kind of searching to get back together to where I left off my whole life. <coughs> and um, I also, a little bit like my heroine, had some experiences with housekeepers who I liked better than my parents that I would, would hang out with um, because I didn't feel like my parents were a safe place, but the, these folks I'm thinking about were very kind. And so I did, I did get a bit of an identification very early on, so, yeah. When you were writing your book, did the character sometimes take a turn you hadn't expected? And, and you, you tried to reel it back, but the character kept going, and you just found yourself writing. She wasn't supposed to have a black baby. Because in the first book, she was supposed to get married to an appropriate white guy. And that surprised the heck out of me. And I, I, that's why I wrote this book, because I was like, what's with that? She's such a bitchy woman. Something must be OK with her for her to have done that. And I wanted to find out what it was. And it turns out that was the worst thing she could have done from her parents' point of view, but it was her path to redemption. <coughs> so, yeah, the, my characters are doing weird stuff like that all the time. Yeah. I'm trying to understand, is the, this is the second book of the Yes, book? yes. But are you going back in time? It's actually not a sequel, per se. It's, a, it's, it's taking a place roughly at the same time. OK. So from I'm a different trying, character's point of view. So in this first book, you said that this person is a minor character? Minor-ish, yeah. Uh, but that she has a baby. Right. She's, she's a character so in there. She, is she, in this book, is that child already living? Um, in this book, we go back to her beginnings, her birth her falling in love and having the baby, and it ends in 1779, the same year that the first book ends. So it is a prequel. That's what I'm saying. It's kind it of a companion. Okay. Companion. Right. Just yeah. trying to understand. Yeah. I just wanted to know, where did you grow up? I grew up in, uh, in Hartsdale, New York, which is outside of New York City. Yeah. I have a question. Um, yeah. You did pretty, uh, I, I loved your jokes. You know, the dose that you heard. Right. My first question um, when you finished reading was about the vernacular. And um, I was going to ask you how you re 
researched um, different dialects and different, you know, how people would speak. Because so often we tend to want to go to the vernacular when we're writing black characters. Mm -hmm. And they're not they don't necessarily, from what we found, if we looked at Harriet Wilson's book, she wrote in the same language that you know everybody around her was speaking. There wasn't a particular Harry Jacob, Harry Jacob. Harriet Wilson. Harry Wilson. Harry Wilson. I don't know how it was in her book Our Name. So there's other um, and I remember Gates when he spoke about, you know, they said, oh, she sounds like she's white. He said, no, she sounds like a black woman who is from New England. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, and if you notice, John Watkins doesn't have any accent, because he was born here, but um, Cassie has come over just in the last 10 years. So she, she literally, if a person, I mean, I really try to use very high standards for my choices, and Cassie, someone 10 years out of Barbados or not even would sound like they're from there, whereas John Watkins was born here. He's as Port Smithian, I don't know what you call it, as, as the rest of you guys. So it really depended where each character came from. They all, they all sound different. Yes. Yeah. So that was one, going to be one of my questions. And the other one is how you sidestep some of the stereotypes that we always see in, you know, in writing. You know, we don't want to make our black male, you know, handsome, he can't be handsome. Um, you know, the stereotype is the big black guy that has, you know, the brutish guy, right. you know. And then you fall in, you know, we fall into the same thing, light skin is preferred to dark skin, you know. So there's, there's so much in your writing that you have to, you know, all the, all the little writing bombs that you can get into. Well, you yeah, this. and you know these are very good questions you raise, and I'll just I'll just say briefly that um, when I write, I'm not thinking in terms of being politically correct because I find that not that you're being, but there is that level of political correctness that says, oh, don't make a handsome black guy or don't do vernacular, and what I'm trying to to go for is authenticity of, of the human being, of each individual human being. And when I went, I didn't know exactly what this guy was going to look like when Eliza fell in love with him. And the more I thought about it, I thought, it's going to have to be someone that looks a little more like her. I mean, it just I just don't think she's good, ready in that time period to make that leap. So it wasn't because of what I you know, would have thought um, someone could do today, but trying to stay authentic to a, a white woman of that time period. So that's that's why. The other issue is I know the limits of my empathy, and I, I didn't think that I could fully, fully empathize with a dark-skinned black man of that period, a man who'd come from um, the South, say. I mean, I tried to imagine a Southern black man. I just couldn't put myself in there. So, you know, I have my limits and I, my, my guiding light is the truth and the authenticity and so I, I just only go so far as I feel I can do, really. If that, if that helps. Yeah. Um, first of all, I commend you on having written two books. <laughs> Thank you. Period. Thank you. I've written my own and it's taken me 15 years. Um, I guess it's a, I have a question and a comment. Um, all respect to writers who can get published. I, you know, so uh, I, I hold you in esteem. Um, I feel like it's a huge butt kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a butt, but it, it's a polite butt. Okay, go ahead. Um, but I guess I'm feeling kind of in your shoes, but not in your shoes. And I guess what I want to ask is, why didn't you do what I did in a situation where I wanted to put my characters in Louisiana, I'm from the North, I don't know anything about the South. Right. I can't speak uh, the vernacular of people from New Orleans where my setting was supposed to be. 
So I didn't even go there. You know, I didn't even dare deal with such a rich culture and even try to, to understand it. I traveled to Louisiana twice, and I realized, you know what, there's just so much history here, and I'm a black American thinking that I have some sense of, you know, culture. But Louisiana is such a rich and different culture than even I understand. Mm -hmm. So I placed my characters in a university town where I wouldn't have to deal with those issues. Well, so I'm, my, question, yeah. my question is, I mean, it's very daring of you, and obviously you're successful at it, because you're, you're publishing your second book. But what made you really even want to tackle that? Because of the complexity. I, I'm on the, I'm living on the edge. I'm living <laughs> on the edge, um, and I mean, I think it's a good question. Like I said, I, I enjoy knowing how far I can go where I lack an experience. And that's what, not just with black characters, but with white characters too. I mean, I've had some pretty insane white characters in my books, and I like feeling how far can I go and really understand, get inside of them and understand what makes them tick. Um, so it's something I do with all of my characters and all of my settings. And if I feel like I can't, when I started book three, um, which is a little baby's story, I realized almost immediately I couldn't do it without going to Barbados. So I went and I spent time. And, and then I felt like I could. So my imagination took over. And you're growing, huh? You're growing. Yeah. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Did I read that you self-published these books? No. Um, originally, I had published. No publisher would take the Midwives Revolt. Okay. This was way back when. Yes. And I published it and actually did really well. I published it myself. That's what I just asked. But I then a publisher you? came along and, and bought it and reissued it and right. now has bought this one and the next one that's coming out next year. But the original ability to get the story out there was that you, you self-published. I did. And it was based on the sale of the books that somebody said, well, it was based on the reviews. The reviews, yeah. was based we'll, on the we'll take them. And that's a pretty exciting thing. Yeah. And, and, that's, and the other thing, I, you know, I don't really, um, the idea that it's historic fiction I think that takes courage. I think that's on the edge. But what I really, sort of bringing it back to, here you are in Portsmouth, without the, the actual people that were in this town and all the scholarship and information that was in that book, could you have written this book without Valerie Cunningham's book? Or the, this book right in front of you? Is um, Cunningham? Yeah. Oh. Let me just put it a different way, the way I experience it, is that historical facts inspire me. Okay. So there are many reasons why those facts helped. Uh, those characters moved me the, to the extent she, she understood them, but others would have done as well for me. So I would have found other accounts probably, but... Well, I, I would suggest that in fact, that's one of the thrilling things that's happened over the last 20, 25 years. It, no, this is a town that loves history. But 25, 30 years ago, when you went into the historic houses, you, which I love to do and when I moved here, they didn't tell you about Prince Whipple. They didn't tell you about John I wouldn't have been able to set it here. Without Valerie's book, I wouldn't have been that's, able to set it. So to me, go. that's the thrill. I, I, there's very scant evidence, so I, I need something, something to hook my, you know, get my Right, teeth. and the fact that, you know, this other lady is saying, what it takes to research in order to, is your goal is, I want to have authenticity. Right. So the idea of how do we create authenticity in historic fiction. It's a lot of work. It's, it's a lot of work. And without, again, these stories were hidden for so long in a town that is so prideful of its history that it's just, and when you describe of coming into town and seeing that house, now, my understanding that that house is not on its original foundation. If it's up there on that hill, is that is that correct? The Sherburn House. It's been the, it's been moved. It's been moved. So, um, you know, what what's the story? It's history and.
and stories being told, and it is a it is a courageous thing to say I'm going to tell a story and try to put myself into that time and place and create authentic characters. And I love hearing about your process of the characters telling me it's going to do X, Y, or Z. I've got a that that creativity, the idea that the character comes <laughs> forth from you and is doing things that you didn't anticipate. Right. So to me, that's a fascinating. Well, everyone gets to pick some different ways. Of the this, writer's you know, craft. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> really interesting. John Watkins has blue eyes, correct? But that would mean that uh -oh. yes, yes, the mo yeah, the mother also. The mother has yes. yes, and that that's something. And digging into my research too, that a lot of these, a lot of the slaves looked, you know, very light skinned, and there's a good reason for that. I mean, the masters were doing whatever they wanted. Um, I'm sure you've seen pictures of the slaves during the Civil War era, which a lot of them look very white. Jefferson and Sally Hemings, if you want to know about them, that they're in my next book. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> yeah. uh, we lived in uh, South Carolina for seven years. I moved down there from Connecticut. And we had the opportunity to go to, to uh, different adult learning classes and so forth. And there was a guy who researched the slave markets in Savannah. And one of the astounding things we learned from his research was there's all those beautiful mansion homes in Savannah. Behind every one of them was a carriage house. And that's, I think they called them Gandhi dancers. They're black concubines, lived. And they're all very religious men, very well respected in society. Don't get me started. I just, yeah, I mean. And nobody talked about it. Nobody talked about it. Don't get me started. If you, if you want to educate yourself, um, yourselves on, on that, I would recommend Harriet Jacobs' um, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. And she, she depicts it really really uh, a lot of detail. So. In, in your, I guess I quick, does it, it's off of the topic to a point, but um, have you researched in your, like, in your, in your studies, have you seen in what way the slaves were treated medically? Was there somewhere a doctor, a specific doctor who would take care of them? Um, did they have a system set up or anything like that for medical attention? That's yeah, a very interesting question. It really depended on the region um, and depended on the, the wealth and the stinginess of the master. If they had the money and they weren't stingy, then they would get the doctor. But if, but if one of those ifs didn't come into play, uh, sometimes there was no medical attention. So John Watkins' mother died because uh, Benny Wentworth's wife didn't want her to live, essentially. Did, she didn't even get a doctor, just waited for her to go because that was the, one of the mistresses. So I think it all depended on the situation. But uh, sometimes they get- Big rip free, how did that go? Who delivered the kids, the children? That again is, depends on the depends on the region. Some people, some people in the earlier times, there were no doctors per se. They were just more or less skilled people. And the midwives, I would, if I were like really sick, I'd probably get a midwife to come rather than the doctors. So, but how they treated the slaves <coughs> depended on the family. Depending. Yeah, I would say that. So they were pretty much uh, the masters of the home or the plantation. Well, I'm, we dealt with plantations in Jamaica. Oh, so my. That's a whole different story. I was considering Jamaica for their background. I don't, I don't remember why I chose Barbados now. Yeah. I forget. But, but Jamaica, we did not play at all. We were one of the earliest revolting yes. countries. We did not stay slave very long there. Yes, I, I know, and I really nearly set the, the, the whole backstory in Jamaica. And there was yeah. some reason why I didn't, but um, yeah. But it's all interesting, and I, I, I mean, this is something that has been long awaited. I'm so happy to see that we're having a conversation. Yes, mm -hmm. that's so important. Yes. I'm sort of intrigued in, in terms of um, not only do you do the um, writing along the black line, but this 
have said it in the revolutionary time when the whole issue was freedom and right. the whole struggle was who gets to be free and how and right. when. Um, was there a struggle as you were writing um, to and asking yourself, how much is this a romance and how much is this going to reveal <coughs> the background of the sort of crackle of freedom issues that are behind the romance? That's a nice question. Um, actually, you know, this is marketed as a romance because that's what's going to sell books. And I do care about the romance in here, but one reviewer was very annoyed. One reviewer recently wrote a review and gave three stars. There's only about 10% romance in here. So um, the book has a whole lot else going on, uh, all kinds of interpersonal relationships. But um, it's all about, it's not just uh, black white issues of freedom, it's also about women's freedom. So my first book, The Midwife, she has a lot of freedom. Eliza doesn't have a lot of freedom. She's pretty much in a jail herself, and that's part of her problem. So there's a lot of, a lot of layers of that meaning of freedom, and of course it's ironic because, you know, John Watkins is a shipwright, and he's building those ships of war. He's building the America and the Raleigh. I'm pointing out there, is that the direction for Badger's Island? I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but he's a slave, and he's the one building these ships. So he carves his initials in one of the planks um, just because he wants to put himself in there somehow. I'm going to cry, but, um, but there's, a, there's a good end. How much has the research um, changed your own worldview? Wow. What was the question? How much has the research changed my worldview? Um, I feel like I know a lot. And that puts me a little bit, not everything, obviously, but I teach in a local high school, and there's a lot of talk, that come in a lot of blah, blah, blah about racial stuff. And I, I get annoyed with, um, with people just speaking a party line without actually knowing anything. I like to try to get at the truth. I like to try to have conversations. And that's not happening. That's not happening in my local high school. In fact, I told my students, I told one group, they were 11th graders, and I said, this weekend, I'm going up to Portsmouth, and I'm going to talk about what it's like to write black characters as a white person. And if you could have look, seen the looks on their faces, it was like I was told them I was going to fly to the moon on one of these chairs, like without a seatbelt. <laughs> they just looked at me like it was, they were terrified for me, and they didn't want to even have a conversation about it. We were, we were reading Hot Fan at the time, but they didn't want to talk about it in what, what, what causes that kind of phobia or that? They're what scared. They're so scared. The so white kids what? are scared of being called racist. Um, the black kids are scared of being hurt because the, our, our black kids in my Newton suburb are mainly what we call Metco students. They come in from the metropolitan area as, as um, kindergartners. They get on a waiting list at birth, basically. And they come in to, the, to this fancy suburb um, but they never quite feel like they belong there. So they're, they're scared. A lot of them are singletons. There's like one black kid per class, although we're trying to get a couple of kids per class. They don't feel so alone. So no one wants to talk about any of this stuff. And that's how you learn, how do you understand people's feelings. Exactly. Uh, how can we teach talk Huck Finn and not be talking about it? Well, we talk about it in terms of 18, 30s, 1840s. Mm. Well, how many years has Metco been around? Because that's pretty well, interesting. Yeah. That's a surviving entity of the whole school desegregation. Right. Uh, right. But it is, uh, so you're at Newton, are you at the, the uh, Newton country South High School? Is that the one that's the most expensive high school in the country? No, that's the north of the north. Okay. So, but you also have issues in, you know, which high school are you at? Are you at the north or the south? But I'd, I'd like to have these kind of conversations with young, with young people, and they're just scared. Well, you're in the heart of, of uh, you know, one of the interesting, um, let's face it, I mean, the kids that are at, at those Newton schools, they're the ones that are, uh, you know, 
taking the five AP courses and hoping they get into their top choice school. And I hope that those Medco students are given uh, lots of depth. Um, well, that's too bad because you know that's that's the real way to make yeah. a difference. Is no, I, I love so the power to go and and get on a path. I like to do a kind of tea talks for the young folks. I'm quitting my job at the end of the year though. I've had enough tea <laughs> tea. I'm so done. No, I'm just going to be a full time writer at the end of the year uh, and just write and, and take care of myself because doing two jobs is just not too much. But no, we should have tea talks for the young folks so they can come and. Talk to each other like without fear that the sky is going to fall down. That, that, that's really surprising to me, and I've always wondered about this, especially in our current um, political uh, environment, because you think that with the next generation it gets better. That in each each of success, succeeding generation, we we we've seen more, we've spoken to each other more that we can start to understand each other more. But it doesn't seem that way where we are right now. Mother, because in listening to all of this conversation, very, very interesting. Number one, considering my age, I'll be 87 this year. Yeah. I grew up four blocks from Bradley Street in Cambridge. I lived in 1556 Cambridge Street across from Newville Hospital. Wow. So I grew up right there. Oh, wow. And uh, so I'm listening to these people starting out with their Bradley Street in my head. But I wanted to say, as we talk about Medco students, and, and I've heard a lot about them because my grandson went to the uh, um, Newton North or whatever, yeah. and, and the Medco students were busted, <coughs> but he lived in he lived in Newton. I want to talk about where my children went to school in West Medford. And that was a black community. And when I moved there, that was the first time I'd ever lived in a black community. I liked it very much. Our school children, when it came to being de facto segregated, tested higher than all the children. They had their little black school with all the little black children. They tested higher than all the children in the city of Medford. You need to look this up. Wow. So being convinced that, oh, because it's a black school, children can't do it, that's not true. Right. These children tested higher, and by de by desegregating them, then they got dispersed all throughout the school, the town, and lost a lot of what they would have had in their own rich school. So we need to think about the power structure and the experiments that are done, and just not all oh these ghettoized children they can't learn anything. They're in the school. Right. So this, these are some of the things to bring to bear when you're looking at these stories and hearing yeah. these stories. Okay. It's very yeah. Yeah. Um, Any other questions? You got any album all over there? <laughs> <laughs> it's a oh, tea talk. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Speak up a little bit. Okay. Sorry. What was it that inspired you in the book, Black Portsmouth, that Valerie Cunningham wrote? What were some of the things that well, were very like, inspirational? Like Primus, what was his name? The, um, what was his last name? Fowler. Fowler. Oh. Fowler. The, the, uh, the guy who ran the printer, an old man, uh, he was in, I think, in his 70s at the time that he ran that printer, and he was a very beloved citizen. And he would walk the streets and go to his printing shop like a free man. And I mean, when I read that, I just cried. I felt like, oh my God, I have to, I have to find out more about these, these, uh, these folks. Um, some of them had a fair amount of freedom, is what I, you know, freedom in quotation marks. Uh, some of them had had a good time. Puppy. <coughs> I have a couple scenes in my book where he's playing the violin, and Eliza's really jealous because they're all having a good time and dancing and, and partying and she wants to be with them. She wants to be with them. So uh, reading just a few little snippets, we don't have that much. My imagination just kind of went wild. Cuffy's a real character. Um, Cuffy Whipple, I think it was. Yeah. Does 
do you um, discuss the Declaration of Independence? I know that's not the right word. But the document that was put together. Petition of freedom. Petition of freedom. There were two. Well, there were a number of documents. There was, there was the uh, because that's the loyalty huge. test, and then there was the petition. The petition came later. The uh, that legal free open petition that came out after the date of my book. Okay, that's what I was um, Yeah, so that didn't happen at that time. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned you were a high school teacher. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, so you were mentioning how your white students are fearful of discussing race in any sort of way, and I feel like that's pretty, like, general, not just in young white people, but just white people in general. But I would say with young people, how do you address those issues of race in your schools, especially with being a predominantly white institution? Well, okay. That's a really good question, and I, I can only answer for myself, because I don't know, I don't think we solve it as a school at, at all. But in my own classroom, for example, Huck Finn has the N-word, right? And the politically correct answer of what to do with that word is don't go near it, don't touch it, skip it over. And um, I, I don't want to, I didn't come into teaching that making any assumption about how anyone felt or anyone's, you know, a black kid would automatically feel one way and all the other black kids would feel that way. They actually have different feelings about it, you know, like, mm -hmm. like, like the rest of humanity. They're all individuals and some of them are okay with saying the word and I, I educated them on well, why I think it's important to say the word. Some of them really felt uncomfortable and it just gave them a visceral, they go, okay, Miss T, I get, I get it intellectually why, why it's important to understand um, that, that um, Mark Twain himself was, was a good guy, uh, but I still don't want to use that word. And, and so we talk about it, but they're generally afraid to just talk because um, the R word is thrown around a lot and other words are thrown around about the black kid, so uh, I try to talk about it, and sometimes I stumble and make mistakes. But you have to be fearless. You have to just be willing to have the conversations. You know, sometimes I say things that somebody is offended by, and I'd rather do that. And I'd rather them correct me. So, no, Misty, that's not how you know. They, I'd rather them correct me than just kind of, well, let's not just you can go there. Oh, yes. oh, she wanted to finish. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. No, it's okay. Um, I'm going to say as long as you are, by the way. I find this all fascinating, but um, whenever you're ready to break, I'm, I'm happy to break. So you're talking about, um, about that you were reading Huck Finn. I feel like if you're talking about like the use of the N-word, do you use it as an opportunity to talk about it, I'm assuming you're an English teacher. Yeah. So I feel like if you have the opportunity to not only talk about what the reasoning is for Mark Twain to use that word as, you know, as a device in his as book. Part of the satire, yes. 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 I understand that. But wouldn't that be an opportunity to discuss the race issues not only with the black students that are in your classes to justify it for them, but to open up the conversation for the white students so that they don't feel fearful of addressing these issues. So mm -hmm. it, it gives them a sense of accountability of the discrimination that they could be perpetuating. Because as a young person myself, like it isn't just, like the tea talks aren't just for older people. These are for everybody. Well, I, I've lost track of the original part of that question. About um, addressing um, racism as like within the literature that you're learning, not only for the black students to feel comfortable in the class, but for the white students to also have an opportunity to address it and not just, not just allow them to shut down because they're right. uncomfortable, because they don't have to deal with the realities of racism, which is right. a piece of privilege in of itself. Right. Um, so just to say they're fearful, so like that doesn't get you anywhere. 
Right. Um, I can't give you any example off the top of my head just because I think I'm a little getting a little tired. Uh, we have pretty deep conversations at times. I can't say anything's resolved, but I know that one student uh, explained to me the, in you know how hip hop and I G G A is okay. Like you know they've they've taught me the various nuances of nigger as said in, in one context, blacks among each other, or with an A. And so we have these conversations, and I have I just can't think of uh, specific conversations with my white students because they're all you know in a group. We talk about it together. Yeah, my question, my, this is not so much a, as a question, but just as a suggestion maybe um, to, so that there's not so much, as you said, fear or, fear or difficulty, so that things could move along more smoothly if the conversation is all encased in L-O-V-E, you know, of mankind, and that we're all one under the canopy of heaven, and when, when everybody has different backgrounds. But well, mine, I can speak for mine, that because of my Christian upbringing, that love conquers all. And, and uh, 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 love washes away a multitude of sin. <laughs> and, and no one is perfect, no one, yeah. no one race. That's and God right. made everybody to be together. So we're one happy family. So, right. you know, based on that, you know, things should just move right along. There's I a reason that. and a time, and yeah. if this is a time for this conversation, hey, welcome it. Yes. It's all good. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. Thank you. One love. <laughs> <laughs> I just like to make one comment yeah, in terms of, uh, of washing things under the rug, so to speak, of, of, of fear of having certain conversations. Uh, prior to uh, Valerie's book and the research that she did on the Ferry, we all know that the, the uh, historic houses here in Portsmouth were very fearful of talking about the fact that there were slaves in the household. They, you, you could go to these houses, they would tell you the story, but never would they say anything about that. And uh, Valerie's research in her book uncovered that, and it started the conversations that, that we're having today. So we really have to face these things and talk about it and have these conversations in order that we get the full story. Thank you. And you know, I went to the Whipple House, the Moffat Ladd House, and I, I, at, I went on several tours there because a lot of the action takes place there. And I said, well, so those barracks in the back, where those, that where they put their slaves? Because they, they don't have anything about the slaves in their brochure. And, and uh, I subsequently learned, they said no. But I'm not sure I totally believe it. I work at the Moffat Ladd House. Oh, thank you. I'm a tour guide at the Moffat Ladd House, and I've so, been there for four years. So ever since I've been there, we talked about Prince and Company and, Cuffey and Did they stay in the attic? Or no, yes, there are okay, both cool. in the attic. They stayed in the attic. That L that you see, that was not slave. That okay. Was All right. I wasn't sure. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, that's just a little aside. But I was curious, and I, and I eventually didn't find out. But if you really know where this is, you know the song's name. Yeah. Yeah. I think now we will uh, close this part of the uh, tea talk and uh, open it up for the book signing for those of you who are interested. And remember, you can purchase the book today for $10. And thank you all so much for coming. Thank you so much.